welcome to this week's edition of the Research Sofa. I'm here today with Carolyn and David who are going to talk about physical health of people with SMI. So over to Carolyn. Hello, thank you very much, Emily. I'm Carolyn Chu Graham. I'm a GP in Manchester and Professor of General Practice Research at Keele University. And uh, Keele is one of the key partners of the Closing the Gap Network. Okay, I'm, I'm David Shires. I'm a former GP. Um, my daughter's had a severe mental illness for over 20 years, and I'm here today talking really in, uh, in, um, in that capacity as a, as a carer of a daughter with, with a severe mental illness. Okay, so uh, Karen, um, just give us a little bit of flavour about why uh, the, the concern about people like my daughter in, in terms of their physical health, because she's got a severe mental illness, what's that mm. got to do with, with physical health? Okay, so as you quite rightly say, people with severe mental illness face a future which is limited by that illness, but they also have a life expectancy uh, re reduced by 15 to 20 years compared to the general population because of physical health problems. So cardiovascular disease, diabetes, COPD, and those um, increased prevalence of those conditions may be as a consequence of inflammatory factors linked with the SMI, they may be due to underlying um, behavior or lifestyle. Um, so smoking, alcohol, poor exercise, poor, act, um, poor diet. Um, and, but they may also be because those conditions are not well looked, well identified and looked after by healthcare services. Okay, and so, I mean, primary care has been an important part of our family life and um, over the years. Um, so in, in, in terms of people like my, my daughter, um, are there, how does primary care typically give her support for her physical health? Okay, so there's something called the Quality and Outcomes Framework, or QAF, which is a voluntary scheme within the General Medical Services contract that GPs sign up to. And one of the aims of the QAF is to support GPs as, as contractors to deliver good quality care. And as part of QAF, there are indicators for a number of clinical conditions, including severe and enduring mental health problems. The targets are re re renewed every year and reviewed and some are removed. Um, but there are indicators in the QAF which relate to the physical health of people with SNI. OK, so and, and how long has the QAF been around? So it was started in about 2004 and actually indicators for SMI were introduced in 2004 and we were all very pleased to see that recognised. However, the targets were reviewed and very significantly reduced in 2014 and so a number of uh, indicators were taken out including um, cholesterol, blood glucose and body mass index. And yet those, those, so those are the sorts of things that you know are important then if you can mm. help people like my daughter avoid developing cardiovascular disease or diabetes so that seems was it was it taken out because things were going all right that you know people like my daughter was getting good access and, and it didn't we didn't need a sort of incentive. well not it, things weren't going wonderfully so the 2012 National Audit of Schizophrenia for England and Wales showed that less than a third of over 5,000 patients who were audited had a complete cardio, cardio metabolic risk assessment in the previous 12 months. And those people who had had a risk assessment, which might be part of COAF in primary care or in, in specialist care, um, many of those had not then had any intervention. So risks had been identified but nothing had been done, say, about high cholesterol and high Q risk or a high HbA1c. OK, so that's mm, bit, so a bit controversial, really. But So that was yeah. 2014. Well, that, um, the, the audit was 2012, and then in 2014, the, some of the indicators were retired. And that was partly because there was a move um, really since 2010 to reduce the number of clinical indicators within COAF and to reduce the number of points available. Okay, that's interesting, because my sister's got diabetes and I don't think any of her cough targets have been reduced, but there you go, I suppose. And lots of the, lots of the diabetes targets have, have been added to, yeah. Lots yeah of interesting, so, so this population get less targets. And I, okay, well, that's quite mm. controversial in itself. Mm. And, and so what's happened since 2004? Is, is everyone happy with that? Or are things well, we weren't happy, were we, David, because we submitted an editorial to BJGP, um, really predicting that, that 
removing some of these targets would have an adverse effect on care. And then in fact, um, a group of researchers um, led by Wilding in 2018 showed that in fact, because of the with, um, withdrawal of some of the indicators, then the activities that had been previously covered by the, those indicators were not being done. So Wilding suggested that GPs needed to be in incentivized to conduct what we thought was, was good care in, in this population. Okay, so here we are in 2021, and how is it now? Well, actually it's good news. So some targets have been reintroduced. So now we have in, in general practice, for people who are on antipsychotics, we have an obligation, according to the COAF, to check alcohol consumption, lipid, smoking, blood sugar, and HbA1c. So those have been have come back, and we've got existing targets anyway of blood pressure, smear, lithium check, and creatinine and um, thyroid function if people are on lithium. So, so some of the targets have come back, which is great. So I guess that takes you as far as identifying the problem. Mm. Um, I mean, is that it? Is the job done then? Well, not, not at all. Um, and in practice, often these checks are done by a healthcare assistant who's really good at working through the template, going through the protocol, making sure all the checks are done. Um, but then things do fall down, perhaps, where identification is done, but there's still no intervention. And you and I spoke about the potential for that healthcare assistant consultation um, late last year. And Theana, I think we're going to be able to put the link on the website so people can have a look at that. But I guess yeah. we, we need to go back to that mantra of don't just screen, intervene. Yeah, OK. So um, that's that was our dear late colleague, uh, Helen Lester's uh, contribution really to this. So, so we've got the, the Lester results, which I think would be a good thing also to connect um, with this little, little podcast. Um, the, the final thought I've got is that, you know, my daughter, I look back at the 20 odd years ago, and so there, there you have someone in the late teens, early adult, early, you know, early adulthood, who piled on weight, who had, who suddenly found herself in a world where there was nothing to do. Um, she was surrounded in a culture of smoking, and yet she would be 20 years younger than the population that I, as a GP, were, were sort of concerned about in terms of cardiovascular risk prevention. So I just wondered if you've got any, any particular views on on the issue about how, how, how long do we wait before we start to intervene or even detect problems in this, this group? Well, well, the whole point of the quality and outcomes framework indicators for SMI are that they, they depend on diagnosis, they don't depend on age, unlike other cardiovascular risk screening in, in general practice. Um, however, I think there's, there's still quite a bit of work to be done on, you know, if somebody is shown to have a high Q risk or does pile on weight or does have an increased blood pressure, is smoking, where's the intervention? And ideally, and this is what the Leicester resource suggests, is that if the healthcare assistant or a mental health nurse in specialist care detects a problem, finds risks, then the GP needs to be involved in a collaborative um, framework really so that the GP and the patient and the carer can discuss what the risks are and then what needs to be done so is it weight watchers is it smoking cessation is a statin needed actually this person's got diabetes we, we need to look at diet we need to um, see whether there's an education program available and we need to monitor yeah and I mean my own my only thoughts again is to come back and say that I don't think you can start this too early and mm. I mean, this needs to be done right from the start um, and that, that was a huge opportunity, you know, in, in, a, in a 20 year old, do we wait until the horse has bolted or do we really assertively get in early? I, you know, my experience is absolutely we should start early. And I think that the, the, the downside of the quaff, it's that at 12 months and if somebody's just been started on an antipsychotic and have had 12 months of weight gain, it's too late. So actually both primary and specialist care should be looking when the person first receives a diagnosis, when they first start on an antipsychotic to do the baseline bloods, baseline blood pressure and weight and monitor in that first 12 months. Okay, well, that's fascinating. I mean, I guess, I guess this was just to, to bring this to an end, I, I guess this isn't just, this isn't just one person's job, is it? This, this is, feels like to me, this is a, I mean, integrated is important with primary and specialist care, but I guess it's a job for your whole team. 
it's well. the whole practice team, isn't it? So the healthcare assistant or advanced practitioner or nurse practitioner who's doing the initial health check or, or bloods, but then the GP and the practice pharmacist to look at medication, but the GP to bring everything together. Great. Okay, well, that's, that's fascinating, Carolyn. I, I, I have nothing else to contribute. Is there anything else you want to finish off with? Not at all. Great. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Enjoy the chat. And, and where's Emily? Well, back to Emily. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, um, David and Caroline, for explaining the importance of physical health checks and the importance of getting things in early, right from the start. So thanks to both of you and really enjoyed helping you today on the research sofa. Thank you very much.